Electricast. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Westman demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host Iris and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley. And today we're discussing a foreign film nominated for both Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards as well as Best Picture in the main category, Ryosuke Hamaguchi's Drive My Car. Doraibu my ka. Which apparently is the the uh, the phonetic katakana of the English words, drive my car. Drive my car. Based on the Beatles song, at least the title, is based on the Beatles hit. And I would have thought, well, maybe not the Beatles necessarily. It's a pretty widely used term, except for the fact that this writer also did a piece called Norwegian Wood, also a Beatles hit. Oh, so you're thinking it's not just coincidence. It's just a jumping off point, a lot like Baby Driver, which we'll factor into this discussion later. Baby Driver, of course, a Simon and Garfunkel hit also from the 60s. Is that what the song is about? Not at all. It was just a title that seemed to spawn some inspiration for a story that ultimately became that Hmm. movie. Very appropriate title for a movie that's all about driving in cars. Or a car. Yep. So we're going to do this interview style. Okay. Where I am going to interview Iris. I don't know if a lot of you know that originally that was our concept for this podcast was Iris interviewing me, a self-proclaimed movie nerd who saw anything and everything I could get my hands on. In this case, I'm taking a back seat (laughs) and we're doing this interview style. But why? Am I qualified? Absolutely. Iris has been to Japan multiple (laughs) times. She knows enough of the katakana and Japanese to help us out here. She's read Uncle Vanya dozens of times, knows that text by heart, uh, has performed in the Uncle Vanya play, and has driven a car professionally for clients. Uh, Some amendments there. I have studied Chekhov, and uh, I was a, quote, precision driver on one of my first PA gigs. (laughs) Yeah? Yep. And I managed not to run into anyone or anything, unlike Brian's locations manager. Did he tell you that his locations manager, who was trying to find a place to drop the porta potties, rammed his personal car into the police car picture car? (laughs) (laughs) Nope. Uh, On one of our first days uh, of shooting at the Talents House for the show I'm currently on, the uh, location manager drove and lost control and crashed into their gate. <laughs> no. <laughs> on the first day, it's like trying to maintain, uh, really, you know, relationships with the talent. It, it wasn't a good look. But, Painful. But I have utter, utter faith in you. You are qualified. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Top of the film, out the window, skyline, and she's all naked in shadow, and then she starts telling a weird story. Did you think she was a murderer? <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew she was telling a story. I mean, at least I knew soon enough before I started thinking about her being a murderer. And then that's confirmed when Kafka-san talks to the young kid in the car during their heart-to-heart when he expresses that she would always get her inspiration for stories after sex or after orgasm. I get it. But in the beginning, when we don't have that context, she starts talking about a girl. And I was like, she is totally going to go all basic instinct and murder this dude. (laughs) I mean, she could have. It's like power of the dog. She could have gone in for the kiss or the kill. Why did Oto say, don't say wife? Yeah, that's a good question. I was thinking, okay, either they're not married and they're in a partnership or this is some kind of PC thing, which I'm not sure if that's really a thing in Japan. So I wasn't sure about that. Kafku-san, he goes to the airport and Kelly immediately when he drove to the airport and there was no one there and like the parking lot at the airport was deserted. She was like, "Uh uh-oh, here's where the zombies come. (laughs) Yeah, Narita is a notoriously busy airport, so that was a little unrealistic. 
did you get an edge, an undercurrent of some kind of tension? It feels like thematically her storytelling may have been innocent, and obviously they were in a compromised position, the both of them, but it did feel ominous to me almost from the start. I think this is our Western sensibility that there needs to be something more sensational going on in this movie, whether on the surface or in subtext. But really, this is a pretty straightforward, let's talk to each other in my car kind of a movie and story. I wasn't reading into any of it. I was taking all of it for pretty much face value. Obviously, we were presented with her and her weird sex story at face value, and we had to kind of play catch up. But he knew who she is and and who she ultimately was. And it's just kind of an unfolding. But I wasn't sure what that face value assessment was. So Kafukusan turns around when he's told that his flight is delayed. He's going to stay at a hotel anyway, I guess, but goes back home and encounters Oto and the kid who ultimately was the kid that she introduced him to and who ultimately starred in Uncle Vanya. So I'm going to call that kid the, the one that she was having the affair with, Draco. So now we have this boiling undercurrent, this simmering secret. We're not sure that he's okay with it, that he's ever been aware that she's taken another lover, that that's kind of her thing, it's accepted. I'm not even sure if it was truthful when he told Draco that that was her thing. Or if that was him just trying to make Draco feel like crap and make him feel, at least, like he wasn't special. Do you think he was lying to him? I sensed that the effect landed on Draco. There was just the slightest hint of malice or a jab in there. I did feel, like whether it was truth or not, that there was the intention to hurt Draco. Now, that being said, I don't get any sense from Kafka-san that he's unreliable as a, as a protagonist. There was nothing to suggest to me that he was untruthful in really any aspect of his life. It was all kind of very raw and accessible. This is an artist in touch with who he is because in other areas of his life, Kafka-san was a pretty straightforward dude. Again, our Western sensibilities, we're all devious and stuff, especially in (laughs) unfolding our narrative. It passes for cleverness. Right. So then when they're driving and they have this secret between them, or at least the audience and Kafukusan, we know that what he knows and what he feels, at least we think we do. uh, And then everything seems to be okay. They seem to be creatively supportive of one another. She records the dialogue, the opposing dialogue on the tape. And uh, then he listens to that continuously. But still, all her storytelling felt ominous. The look she gives him in the car felt ominous. And I thought murder was one of the two of them was definitely going to die. And then she was dead. (laughs) But not in the way that I thought. Maybe some of these darker performances were meant to portray that dark undercurrent that he mentioned. He mentioned that there was something dark and unreachable about her. But I have to let you know how I watched this movie. So it being a very long movie. (laughs) Very long. (laughs) Three hours, uh, maybe a minute under. Yeah, I had to break this one up. I started it Wednesday night with mom. And I was like, listen, I know I'm not going to make it through this whole film. If you feel like you can, feel free. And I'll catch up with it tomorrow and put something else on for you tomorrow. And she's like, okay, well, I'll see if I like it. I made it 45 minutes in and mom watched all three hours of it. And then she said she couldn't sleep because of how very sad it was. And so when she told me this next morning, I'm like, sad. Okay. I'm like, all prepared for like, and then she's like, oh, and there's some twists. There's some twists in there. And so I was like, oh man. And 45 minutes in, you know, Oto's already out of the picture. And I was like, oh, she didn't say it, but now I know. It wasn't just a brain aneurysm. He did it. So we've all got murder on our minds for this movie. Well, murder on our minds, like thinking that there's deeper meaning to the lost daughter. Kind of like that. The lost daughter. But going back for a moment, if I may, if you were Kafukusan and you walk into your humble abode and you find your wife boning another dude, maybe you're not the acty out type. Maybe you don't grab, you know, a lamp base or or something to murder the dude with. But at the very least, you don't sneak out, you know, oh, I don't want to interrupt their enjoyment. You don't let it keep going, right? You at least say something or slam the door on your way out. What kind of person is like, well, she's almost there and I want her to get it. I want her to get hers. So I'll be quiet about it. Well, uh, he explained that he was so driven by fear, fear of losing her. 
he couldn't speak up. He couldn't let her know what he knew, even though she probably knew and probably wanted him to speak out, right? And that's what he wanted to apologize to her about. He wanted to apologize Uh. to her that he wasn't brave enough to speak out against what she was doing. You said you lasted 45 minutes in, which means that you got the opening credits at kind of like nice (laughs) closing credits, like the end of a first episode. Uh, I did. That was such weird, weirdly timed credits. And they were long, too. It's like 41 minutes, dude. Three hours long for a quiet little Japanese car indie drama. Come on now. I mean, I guess there's three kinds of movements to it. There's the Oto story, there's the play, and then there's the road trip. The road trip where she takes him back to her hometown and we play out that journey in real time where they're on the road (laughs) for hours. But we're not there yet. We're going with the play. Chapter two, Vanya. So you're a Vanya scholar. Oh my God. Am I right in my assessment that the way this narrative is delivered, it's not necessary, it shouldn't be necessary, but it seems like Vanya and this play ties closely, at least in terms of the scenes that they tried to focus on, to the narrative of this story. Sure. Um, A lot of what was said reflects their ideals. It was maybe the things that they couldn't say or wouldn't say in real life, and then they would say it during the play. So the play and the projects that he has sort of add legitimacy to the story and the themes of this film. Because earlier he was in, what was the play he was in initially? Waiting for Godot. So you know these plays much better than I do. Is it necessary and is it relevant for those scenes to play? Is it required for you to have a knowledge of Waiting for Godot or Uncle Vanya? And if so, is relying on that narrative as contributing to yours? Is that a little bit of a cheat? It's not necessary to understanding the otherwise simple storyline, but it does elevate it in some ways. It does kind of also beg the question of if if Uncle Vanya does it and Drive My Car does it to a lesser extent, then why not just do Uncle Vanya with a twist? I mean, I guess it's kind of dated in its own way. And Drive My Car really modernizes a lot of the themes from Uncle Vanya and it sets it in its very specific cultural setting, which feels very fresh. But in some ways, it's the Uncle Vanya themes that give Drive My Car all of its weight. Yeah. And and I wonder if there's a term for that. There's got to be a term, right? Like transference or something? Yeah, something like that. So somewhere in there, he meets Misaki, who is going to be his driver for the duration of the production. A fabulous driver at that. Can't even tell that you're driving. Yeah, we're going to call her baby driver. Did you think, (laughs) A, that Misaki was Oto reincarnated somehow? (laughs) And B, did you think at the beginning that Misaki was a murderer? Misaki was probably more like a reincarnation of their daughter than an Oto. So I'd probably, if I had to place my bet, I'd place it there. Was she a murderer? Yeah, they were both murderers. He decided that. He placed judgment on both of them to that extent. Yeah, murderers in unexpected ways. I was like, oh, she is totally a murderer. Look at her deadpan delivery. Look at her far spaced eyes, which suggests poor genetics. She is definitely a murderer. <laughs> I was questioning the blazer. That was an interesting fashion choice. But weren't they all kind of deadpan I mean, in every conversation that he had with like the theater director and the and the theater owner or whomever those two administrative people were, couldn't you expect that at any moment they were gonna like throw down? I don't know. I don't. I, I was trying to get a handle for these characters and which one of them were murders. I expected it would turn into a movie like that, but of course it didn't. Well, there was murder. There was. It was just a different kind of murder. But uh, Misaki was was a murderer twice over. Not only did she murder her mom, but she murdered Sachi, her only friend, the childhood component of her mother's <laughs> oh fractured God. personality. <laughs> oh, that's really cruel to place double <laughs> blame on her. <laughs> Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Electric.
Smartcast. She wasn't a murderer, but you can tell how, how wounded she was. And she just opted for a very simple life doing something that she knew she was good at. And so he moves on, finds himself doing the play that uh, his wife recorded the dialogue for. And then Draco shows up again. Do you think Draco was stalking him? And really, to what purpose? Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't aware that he mm -hmm. was caught. Mm -hmm. But was he sincere in saying that his wife's work was what drew him? Or was, I don't know, why was Draco following Kafuku-san? He was absolutely stalking him. I don't think it was as coincidental as he made it out to be that, oh, I just happened to look you up and I just happened to learn about this audition. Like, I think it was probably a little bit more intentional than all that. But needless to say, he, I think that Draco, aka, AKA Takatsuki, was less evolved as an artist and as a person. He can't say it quite like it is, like Kafka-san can. So he kind of gets around at ideas a little bit more. But what he reveals to Kafka-san and to us as the audience is that he was in love with Oto. He doesn't quite come out and say it, but he's saying other things like, what was she like in a day to day? What motivated her? Like he's curious because he misses his lover. And this is a way, a weird, immature kind of way to get closer to her by <laughs> befriending her husband. So in the bar conversation, they they both allude to knowing about his indiscretion, right? Which we find out later from the news report is that he was messing around with a minor. So he his career was destroyed. He lost whatever show he had. He was he fell on hard times as an actor, as an artist. He turned to the theater and maybe thought, because I have some history with this family, that maybe this guy will give me a chance. He didn't expect to get cast as Uncle Vanya. And I thought that um, that Kafka-san's justification or logic for having cast him was actually pretty decent. Although I think he had this weird, morbid curiosity about his late wife, sex lover, too. And that yep. did bring them together in this weird, ironic kind of way. And Draco wasn't a bad guy. As you said, the nuanced perspective and narrative of his completion of Oto's story about the girl, as creepy as that was, <laughs> made him out to be another perspective of his wife in a way that Kafukusan was looking to understand. He contributed something valuable, mm. wasn't a bad guy. And so I think when he killed that dude, which is bad, <laughs> maybe it was justified. We didn't know it at the time. And I think they drove that child molestation thing home or that statutory thing or whatever it was to kind of make him be a bad guy. <laughs> He's out of the picture. We yeah. got to do a thing that's unequivocally horrible that will land him in the bad guy camp. Maybe it was necessary to firmly root him in the bad guy camp. This is the rock bottom that this kid needs in order to, like, have a second chance. So the uh, Vanya production takes a curious turn, an international turn, where it's delivered. To, remember, you and I were in London and we saw Turando and they had subtitles, which really helped me. Yeah. So apparently for this international production of Vanya, it wasn't clear during the auditions uh, and the table reads, but in performance, they're subtitling basically for every language that's involved. You saw in the first production, the one where Takatsuki comes to comes with Oto into the green room, like that one was also uh, multilingual and Takatsuki even brings it up. Draco brings it up. He's like, I was invigorated or intrigued or something, something really platitude-y. Yeah, I just thought he was ass kissing. Which he was, but this was Kafka-san's Thing. He was pioneering these these multilingual productions, uh, presumably to like show how translatable and universal the themes are. So we recently talked about Coda and being Kohia ourselves, we are at least familiar enough with the necessity for American Sign Language and hearing impairments. But this other girl, that is not what this was. Explain to me, if you will, your concept of dumbness, because she could hear <laughs> And she signs, which I guess is international sign language. Are Americans, are we like the metric system? Do yeah. we like say we want our own sign language? Is the yeah. other, is the rest of the world universally recognized to use international sign language? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't think so. I think ASL is a thing. I don't know if there's an, a universal sign language beyond that. I think that what's his face did clarify that she spoke Korean sign language. Korean. I thought she said international, but maybe I was wrong. But she 
she made, when she was talking, she would make vocalizations as the family encoded it. And sometimes, you know, if you're coached correctly, you can learn to speak, although with a halting sort of, uh, right. you know, a slightly different voice because of the way you process your breath. How was she unable to speak? Yeah, she was hearing, right? She was communicative in the form of sign language. I don't know if she was mute. I'm guessing she was either mute or she was for some reason unexplained mute by choice all i'm saying it was it was a pretty awkward dinner for sure <laughs> especially given that the other guy is blindsiding his creative director <laughs> with the wife thing i thought yeah. for sure masaki was going to re be revealed to be his daughter or his niece or something oh so i didn't see it coming i'm positive that you saw it coming especially when he's like wait you speak korean sign language you understand it and he kind of dodged the question. He was like, I have something I need to apologize to you about. And, you're, and I didn't even get it at that point. Normally you would, but I'm notorious for not picking up on these things. It's like, show me. It doesn't feel <laughs> clever to me. Like I'm, I'm winning if I'm a, a step ahead of movies. I just want to kind of figure out where they're going to take me. So then it becomes about this weird unfurling of their connection and their shared past and their prospective <laughs> future together. And they take, she, takes him to the Hiroshima dump, but it very much felt like, to me, like this was the Colin Firth component of Love Actually, where he's going to fall for the employee. Tell me you thought that Misaki and Kafuku-san were going to end up together. Uh, I was really hoping against it like I was like Maui and Moana. I was like, please don't fall in love. Like that would just be really inappropriate. Yep. But I didn't think it would happen for two reasons. One, before they even got any remotely intimate, right? They already set up that she's the same age as her as his daughter would be, right? And then secondly, this is Japanese. <laughs> and and that I mean, you can talk you can have like silhouette postcoital creepy talk and the sex got kind of raunchy. I don't know. It just feels like it's either like really buttoned up or it's like kind of raunchy and there's not a lot in between. It's like a Japanese businessman. You know, they're like either really uptight or they're like going in completely insane at the bar or the club or whatever. Oh, yeah. No, this is the three faces, the three Japanese faces. They're freaky. You just don't see it. <laughs> so there was the dangerous game with Draco that they played in the car where I didn't know what the rules were. But they were opening stuff up and they were revealing stuff in front of Misaki. And he's like, she's cool. It's fine. She's not listening. Of course, she is listening because they take that after that. They take the opportunity to go to the dump and climb the hill. And I thought for sure that when they park the car and they're hiking up the hill to this mystery burned out house, this is totally where she's going to kill him. Right. <laughs> You didn't think so? This is my murdering spot. <laughs> right? This is where she murders everybody. But I think that these two, for whatever reason, even if they weren't going to hook up romantically, they 100% deserved and needed each other. Yeah. They were two sides of the same coin. But I still thought, you know, this is definitely where she finally kills him. Or there was going to be the revelation <laughs> and the breakdown, which there kind of was. But she maintained her stoic facade. And he was the one who kind of broke down and was like, we need each other. It was like Bob and the narrator in Fight Club. And they're like hugging him out. And only one of them is crying. It was kind of awkward. Oh, you know what? I think maybe I assumed that they were going to hook up because I was aware that this title was based on a Beatles song. Baby, you can drive my car. Yes, I'm going to be a star. Baby, you can drive my car. And baby, I love you. Beep, oh. beep, beep, beep. Yeah. Wait, is drive my car like a euphemism for you can ride me? Like have sex I don't know. With me? Ew, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Well, they were definitely kindred spirits in their wandering lost soulness and their sorrow and their loss. And that was the emotional revel. That was the denouement, the, irrev the emotionally revelatory moment, right? This is the culmination of all the weird tension between them in the car and the rest of his life. And he com comes to understand everything about his life, uh, his wife's life and stuff and communicates that to her. She kind of faces her own demons quite literally you know, with the burned out house. And then she like stomps down. The, she throws the flowers and ineffectual distance and then tromps down the hill. And I was like, what, is she still in there or something? Is like the mom, what are you doing? But it was an interesting scene and they did their thing. And then it was kind of over. We got the play that, that closes with definite echoes of the movie themes again. It was only supposed to be a few lines 
of Vanya in the script, and it ended up, ended up being extended portions of the dialogue and of the scenes. And so it can't be avoided that much of what they were saying was what they couldn't say on the screen. And then the movie was kind of over, but it kind of wasn't because Misaki, his baby driver, shows up and Kelly was like, that's a different license plate. And I was like, okay, she's driving his Saab. And it was. It was not only a Korean license plate, but she spoke Korean to the lady in the store. So it seems like she did kill him and then she went and killed the mute girl and her family and stole their dog and then stole his sob after killing him, took his car and his money and used it to pay for the scar removal plastic surgery because the scar was gone from her face. Wait, what? Okay, so obviously this coda raises a lot more questions than it does right? answer anything about that. I missed all of that. Why did she have his car? So she killed him. She killed them, took the car, got plastic surgery, and fled the country. For reals? I don't know. Wow. So I so what was very what I got and what was very satisfying is that Kafkusan had a new lease on his artistic life and. Facing Vanya was like facing his fear that he never got to face with Oto. Deep. And we saw him go backstage and struggle through it. But for me, I felt like I had a nice bow on the Kafkasan arc and story. Now, this whole coda with Masaki and stuff, I'm just like, what? What I just assumed at face value was they were all, because I noticed the dog thing too. I just assumed they were all kind of some weird motley family you know brought together by this the events of surrounding this play and now he, she drove she was his permanent driver and she also was the doggy daycare in korea <laughs> i don't know that's bizarre we can't end this podcast episode on a whole bunch of questions you don't have an answer for this no but i didn't have one for murder all the time either <laughs> for the devil all the time. Everyone's a murderer, and this is what happens in Murder Town in Japan. <laughs> well, there's got to be some answers for this to be. Now I'm very unsettled. I feel very unsettled about this film. A, a very long drive. <laughs> a very long movie, and there's a lot to chew on, and more and more besides. For yeah. the cinephiles there was a nice measured unfolding drama for the bibliophiles there was not only vanya but this short story and how it was adapted and pretty wildly changed a lot changed from page to screen and then for the true crime aficionados we had <laughs> lots of murder to unravel i feel like the filmmakers were like yeah we just made you sit through three hours of this story and now we're going to give you a big cigarette middle finger with our ending. <laughs> right. Maybe it was there, but we would love to hear what you think about what the ending of Drive My Car was about. Sure. Could we read the story? Absolutely. Could we really dig into the deeper themes? I guess so. But I, I really think this movie could have been much tighter and could have had more peel outs and rock music a la Baby Driver if they had cut an hour out of it. But I could be wrong. But then we don't get this sprawling, immersive Japanese road trip experience it's what makes it profound and good is it's japanese oh is that is that an official rating are you giving drive no. my car a good no do i think that drive my car should win best picture i don't think so it's not a particularly strong year come at me bro but i do think drive my car will for whatever reason win best foreign language film because it's the one that everyone's talking about the most have i seen the others no is it bad no it's just kind of long and a little bit confusing and I watched it and it's fine. I'm giving it an official all right rating. All right. For Drive My Car, perhaps more unanswered questions than <laughs> satisfactorily tied up storylines. But nevertheless, Drive My Car promises to be a journey and it is just that. So for that reason, I will also give it a crossing the bar rating with a good. So there you have it. An all right from Wes, a good from Iris for 2021's Oscar contending best picture, Drive My Car. We would certainly love to know if you could help us understand the ending Does of this. Does anyone know if, do you know if sobs have big trunks? How many bodies were in that trunk? Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Hey, what's happening out there, everybody? This is Lawrence Ross, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my podcast, The Lawrence Ross Show. Egomaniac. It's a two-hour weekly exploration into my mind. 
I also do sketches, celebrity impersonations. You're out of order! And I also do song parodies. Not too shabby for a blind guy. Not only are you visually impaired, but you are geographically impaired. New episodes are released every Friday. Check it out on your favorite podcasting platform or listen to it here on Society 13 on Electrocast. Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, is that no, that's just my dad. My name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. Touchdown. On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric acid. Electric acid.